the lecture. So uh, good morning. Uh, today we're going to be uh, transitioning on, uh, leaving the, uh, the sphere of agent-based modeling in its traditional sense and going on to another uh, tradition that's also articulated at an individual level, uh, but is has a separate uh, intellectual lineage associated with it, a separate set of purposes for which the models are typically used, and uh, a separate sort of set of building blocks um, by which we we specify models. Um, uh, this other sort of model is uh, known as a uh, type of modeling is known as discrete event simulation, which is a term that's uh, a little bit confusing in light of uh, our joint learnings uh, with respect to agent based modeling. Both traditions are articulated at an individual level. We distinguish particular actors within a population. Both traditions uh, make use um, in many modern forms of agent-based modeling and certainly in discrete event simulation of a uh, approach that characterizes a uh, time as a continuum where the uh, actions of these actors, uh, agents or entities, resources that interact with the entities in the discrete event world, discrete event simulation world, all of those are choreographed by discrete events by, um, by events that occur uh, conceptually instantaneously at a given moment in kickoff actions. These events, in contrast to, to paradigms uh, such as you see with system dynamics and associated compartmental modeling, where time is conceptually continuous, but for practical purposes, it's divided up into to small segments traditionally a fixed duration each uh, by which it's numerically integrated. Um, this sort of um, modeling and system dynamics uh, uh, typically has a certain tempo, a certain uh, uh, level of temporal scale that it affords. Um, if, you, if you want to investigate uh, phenomena that play out at a faster temporal scale, um, at a more fine-grained temporal scale, typically one ends up needing to adhere to a similar scale throughout the period of integration, uh, throughout the period of model simulation. Now, I'm glossing over a lot of technically substantive things here. There are very um, rich sets of integration methods, which are typically these typically supported these days are supported by any logic and so on, which make use of variable step sizes. But typically it's within a fairly small range of variation. Um, what we're talking about in discrete event simulation is an entirely different paradigm where time uh, can, uh, can proceed by leaps and bounds when there's very little going on in the model, when it's in a period of, of stasis. Uh, greater quiescence of the model. There's less happening, fewer agent actions taking place, fewer entities coming into a discrete event simulation. But then when, when things end up uh, going really quickly, when there's a uh, crisis of sorts, uh, a um, car crash uh, for people that need to be brought into an emergency room, um, or over in the agent-based sphere, if there's an outbreak and there's uh, lots of agents uh, sending messages to each other associated with contact, um, then and, and exposure to infection, then things may have to play out very quickly. And uh, whether it's agent-based modeling with discrete event foundation, with that schedule we talked about, that event schedule where, where items are placed in the schedule, when messages are sent or, or agents enter into a state and their outgoing transitions have to be scheduled, or whether it's uh, in the context of discrete event simulation where we're going to have uh, events associated with an agent's uh, proceeding through a workflow, things will often happen very quickly uh, in these periods of punctuated action. So you get these kind of punctuated equilibrium models, which alternate between stasis and 
quiescence on the one hand and, um, and fulsome activity and bustling of, of events being scheduled. And a discrete event scheduler uh, affords that. It allows for great computational parsimony, very, very um, limited uh, resource use during those periods of quiescence. Not much has to happen per year that proceeds or per day that proceeds. But during the periods of punctuated activity, an hour may seem like a year because there's so much going on. And it will scale down to whatever level is natural for those circumstances, according to the processes taking place right now, the phenomena to be characterized right now. That's an important difference to keep in mind. It's an important difference for, for learning, and it's an important difference by extension for pop quizzes and for uh, exams. Um, so both discrete event simulation and agent-based modeling, individual-based traditions have these notions of, uh, of, of discrete event-based uh, uh, sort of choreography of a model um, temporally, uh, but very different outlooks, very different goals to which they're they're typically uh, on which they're typically focused, very different building blocks with which we articulate them. But they are, to a degree, close cousins. And we'll see next lecture on hybrid modeling, how we routinely bring them together and just how compatible they are uh, within our, our models. Uh, next week, you'll uh, have the, uh, the uh, pleasure of, of acquaintance with um, our agent-based model uh, deployed here for our province and indeed for other jurisdictions worldwide uh, for COVID-19. Uh, you'll learn about its hybrid structure and its weaving together of discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling, and to a degree, some elements of, of system dynamics modeling. So uh, we're going to to sort of refresh our memories of discrete event simulation because it was, like each of the other two traditions, a technique that we glimpsed in the first day of class at a brief level and which we subsequently explored in a single lecture which focused on its major elements, its major um, distinctive properties, its hallmarks as it were. So let's, uh, let's go remind ourselves of those because it has been most of a semester since uh, you, um, you were exposed to that material and your understanding has hopefully matured. We'll then go on to some of the nitty gritty that we couldn't talk about earlier, but which will be helpful when building models uh, such as this, uh, models that uh, you'll be seeing more next time um, and which may make their way into the remaining uh, elements of uh, this class. Okay, so uh, with that preamble, I'm going to transition to my slides. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to, I've, I've just posted these slides and uh, I'm going to quickly go over some of the uh, high level points uh, explored last time. But in order to do this well, I'm going to ask you to load in a model. And there's actually two models that you know I, I'd like you to be aware of and explore. One of those is the trauma center model we saw last time. But the main model for today, and the one I'd like you to load right now, is actually the emergency department model. So if we if we go to any logic and we call it up, and I will uh, go and close it out so that I can go through encounter the same experience of you. Let's let's call up any logic help here. Uh, excuse me, any logic help in example models. Um, and what you'll find over here on the left hand side is the set of examples under healthcare. You will find if you scroll down here, let's get this widget out of the way. If you scroll down, you'll find something called emergency department. That is the one that I'd like you to load. Okay, how did I get there? Went to health, went to example models. The left-hand side was examples. I went to healthcare. 
and uh, the healthcare model is showing, I scroll down and selected emergency department. It may also be listed in kind of the omnibus list of all of the, the models. Um, it, it may well be, and perhaps that affords a, a shorter way of finding it. Um, okay, so we have a model here loaded in. And uh, this model provides at first glance several uh, features that will become uh, prominent within uh, this lecture. Uh, it provides uh, illustration of a set of resources, things like rooms for examining patients, waiting rooms, and also gives reference to some resources of, of a more active sort. Uh, technicians, for example, physicians, assistants, and nurses here. Uh, and if you scroll down, you'll find that uh, those resources and more static resources, as well as some portable resources uh, that lack agency but can be carried around are illustrated over here in the resource section. These are pools of resources. And the conceptual model is, and this is in contrast to agent-based modeling, uh, that within a resource pool, we have sort of a commodity of resources. You know, we're not gonna be worked up about whether it was the same ultrasound machine that tests us now or an hour ago, um, or whether it's exactly the same x-ray I'm wheeled into in this trip as last trip. Uh, we're not gonna get worked up whether it's the same exact nurse I'm seeing. Um, rather, we treat them as kind of interchangeable and equally much so if I'm put in one room or another, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's like a taxi. I take different taxis at different times. What matters is the role it plays. So we have a set of resources and then we have a workflow. And this is again, common, typical and uh, commonly a uh, foremost hallmark of, a, of, of discrete event simulation. We have these defined workflows. They may not be unitary. It may, maybe we don't have just one rule workflow to rule them all. But here we have an overall workflow. And the overall workflow posits that some so-called entities, um, which in this case will be patients, will be entering this workflow and they will flow through it. Um, and they will, in the process of flowing through it, undergo a set of processes. Uh, these processes include things like registration, heading to an assigned, being assigned a room and heading to it, undergoing assessment for their severity um, and uh, waiting further and then being assigned a, um, an examination room uh, and, uh, and eventually uh, being, being examined by a nurse and, and physician's assistant and then undergoing one of two possible procedures. Obviously this is a very simplified model uh, before being uh, discharged, having released all the, the resources such as nurses, physicians, assistants, rooms, ultrasound machines, x-ray machines, et cetera, that this patient was allocated in the course of their journey. So you have entities that flow through a defined workflow where their progress along the workflow is gated by the availability of resources. And the lack of resource availability leads them to queue up, such as queuing up here at registration uh, or when, when undergoing waiting for a waiting room, they're, they're awaiting in the waiting room the availability of an examination room. So this is actually what's called a, a, a seized block and they queue up until that seized resource is available. Uh, I believe it's also termed a service block in, in earlier versions of any logic. Um, this is the language of discrete event simulation here and any logic has an instantiation of it, but there's many other packages that, that implement similar languages. A language is languages that specify resources, specify the need to allocate resources, 
uh, to entities, entities flowing through workflows where the workflow progress of that entity is gated by availability of resources. There's queuing and uh, issues associated with how long they've been within this. So for example, there's a, uh, within this process, there's a, uh, there's instrumentation provided to measure the amount of time it takes for a given entity to go from one place to another. And as we'll see, there's resource availability that characterizes um, the utilization of resources. You know, what fraction of the time, for example, are the nurses sitting um, uh, idle? Or to what degree of time is the x-ray machine in active use? Uh, these are the sort of questions which we often in which we're often interested in, in discrete event simulation. Questions of resource use, questions of waiting times and length of waiting queues, uh, questions concerning the, the placement of resources, whether, for example, it might afford a more efficient operation if we were to place the x-ray machine more centrally among the uh, the patient uh, rooms, or if we were to have the nurses and the physician's assist assistants uh, on either side of the waiting room rather than being shunted to, to both sides here, et cetera. Uh, to what degree would it help processing in terms of throughput, the number of people we could see per day, for example, if we had two x-ray machines rather than just one, or if we added five more physician's assistants or two more nurses. These are the sort of questions that discrete event simulation often pursues. There are entities here. These entities are articulated at an agent-based model. They're not merely counts as they were in aggregate system dynamics of people in different states. They are individual entities. They can be lent heterogeneity, although that's often more a little bit more muted in this tradition. They, they experience different transitions. Some may need ultrasound, some may need x-ray and different variability associated with how long it takes them to make their way through the, the workflow. But these, inter, these entities, whilst not quite solitudes, they have very little interaction. They, in contrast to agent-based modeling, where agent-agent interaction is the name of the game, that's that's seen as being often the 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 uh, central focus of a model, the, the 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 nexus by which agents come together and interact is that which gives rise to emergent behavior more generally. Here, the agents do interact, but in a very simple way, typically, in one way. They compete for resources in the sense that if you get into that x-ray machine just before I arrive, I'm going to wait for you. But the agents aren't transmitting infections to each other. They're typically not transmitting attitudes towards each other. They're not leading each other to balk and say, look, I'm out of here, man. You know, I've been waiting here for three hours and, and I'm inspired, I inspire someone else to leave. It's not like that at all. Uh, typically these entities um, keep each other waiting. They queue up um, nearby each other, but there's very little interaction. More foundationally though, the, the entities within these models, while at a, at a casual level, seemingly similar to agents, um, they have less, less obvious agency. They, um, they can make decisions. They can elect to leave early if, if their patience is tried too much. They can opt out of a procedure that's seen as, as being um, contrary to their preferences. But they flow through these workflows, typically in a rather passive fashion, ladies and gentlemen. They are operated upon by these processes uh, rather than striding upon the world and, and undertaking um, you know, interactions with other agents in some purposeful fashion. So 
the the role of entities or what we might reasonably call agents here is predominantly a more traditionally more passive sort of uh, view. It it um, it views them as as kind of uh, baggage to be handled in this process, you know, uh, work to be done for each uh, for each entity, um, quality of service to be provided to those entities, but they're they're not um, the active uh, shapers of their futures that we see with an agent based model. Okay, these these entities are are more more passive in orientation traditionally. Now, uh, there's nothing that would prevent you from starting to, you know, break break the normal traditions, the normal norms, and imposing a more active role here. One could, and indeed, we'll see we do exactly that within hybrid modeling. But um, but just be aware that in terms of traditions. In terms of lineages, um, in terms of our whoa, uh, in terms of our sort of uh, traditional way of of, um, of building of, of viewing these models, the, the tradition has been um, has a more passive role of, of entities. And indeed, sometimes entities lack anything that we would call agency. Maybe these are doses of vaccine that have to be sorted and handled and packed up into containers with dry ice and flown to northern Saskatchewan or, or delivered within uh, clinics, et cetera, without freezers uh, or in, in pharmacies. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes these might be applications for CERB payments through the central government for those uh, who have lost opportunities through the pandemic. And uh, they're not agents in a traditional sense of agent-based modeling in a fulsome sense of agency, uh, but very much compatible with discrete event simulation. In discrete event simulation, we also have this kind of uh, enshrined, baked in distinction between uh, a, two different sorts of what you might recently now view as agents from your perspective of agent-based modeling. On the one hand, we have these entities which flow through. And the other hand, we have these, these resources that uh, are also equally articulated at an individual level, equally can be associated, if you so wish, with some degree of heterogeneity um, at some cost. And um, that are, are things that interact at various points with the, with the entities uh, can be summoned, but can escort that entity to a certain room, for example. The resources like a nurse might go fetch an ultrasound machine uh, or go obtain a wheelchair and bring it in as a as a as a resource or might allocate a room for that agent so uh, for that entity so we have these these agents who are kind of divided in this in this dichotomous way between entities the ones on whom the process is operating and these supporting actors who are also you know parties that may may move around with agency but do so at the behest of the um, the entities that that are flowing through. The world revolves around the entities, and the resources serve the entities within some constraints. For example, their schedule constraints, availability, etc. Now, uh, if you look at this, you'll notice that there are two icons here that are not like the others in this workflow. And uh, this is something that mirrors also a tradition in, in uh, uh, agent-based modeling that we learned about in contrast to system dynamics modeling. Specifically, we have um, some other parties such as ultrasound, uh, 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 ultrasound needs, and they can have processes defined on their own. So there can be hierarchical processes 
Here's an X-ray process uh, within this model. Uh, and the X-ray process involves a number of steps, which when we depict it in the model as a whole are abstracted. That all goes on in within this little area of the ultrasound process and the X-ray process, okay? So we can have a hierarchy of processes, um, much as an Asian-based modeling, we could have a conceptual hierarchy of scale or of, of, uh, uh, of, of sort of nested context. Okay, so um, within this sphere, uh, we have things that conceptually are tied to agent-based modeling, but um, but kind of view view it from a different angle with different goals associated with it. And you may remember from this very seat, ladies and gentlemen, in the opening days of the course, I argued that the three modeling traditions we'd be exploring, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation, they they do use different formalisms, different building blocks, different ways of specifying change in a model that's based on the current state of the model. But what distinguishes the most is typically the questions for which they're, that they're seeking to address. And the questions we're seeking to address here uh, are ones that I articulated earlier. It's level of resource utilization. It's issues having to do with the degree, the, the, the throughput of our system, how many, you know, how many individuals we can, uh, entities we can handle per day, we can process per day, um, how long they have to wait, um, how long the waiting queue is, uh, where to put resources. It's, it's focused typically on resources and uh, quality of customer experience or quality of, of uh, experience of the entities um, and the duration of that experience, et cetera. Um, so discrete event simulation here um, could be viewed as sort of a form of resource-based modeling. And we've articulated the major elements uh, of it. You'll notice that there's a certain more limited scope to this model as well. Um, you know, these entities arrive as if coming out of thin air, and they depart into the ether as well. Uh, whence they come, whither they go after this leaving uh, is left, you know, unspecified. It's like those clouds in our system dynamics models out of which births come or into which deaths go. Um, there's, there's typically not the focus on a kind of lifetime of an entity here, um, that a life course perspective. By, con by contrast, in agent-based modeling, you're typically following these agents, you know, through their through their life, which affords us a chance to look, for example, at how social determinants of health, um, early life insults or early life experiences, traumatic events. Uh, experience of adversity and housing or, or location or access to education, et cetera, might shape a person later in life. Um, within discrete event simulation, we're typically focused on, you know, an institution or a, a process. And it has a very defined uh, shorter kind of span. There are exceptions. You could keep someone around in a loop and and handle them for years later. Maybe it's a veteran being handled by the, the, the Veterans Administration in the US or Veterans Affairs in Canada. Um, and, you know, are handled on an ongoing basis through a lot of their life. But it's less of a inclusive, like this is the world type approach and more of a, of a focus on a defined set of workflows. Um, so again, a difference in philosophy. Uh, so we have these flowcharts that operate upon entities, these workflows through which entities flow. Um, they are processed by this. Uh, resources are acquired for them at different step. And there are these limited capacity resource pools um, here, which, um, uh, which sort of provide um, limited service 
um, to the entities that flow through. Um, so you can uh, see them here, for example. Um, and uh, they have schedules associated with them. They can have, for example, downtime, off time, or breaks. They can have uh, schedules about when they're serving and when they're not. So they work, you know, most work Monday to Friday, but there's another uh, nine to five, but there's another shift of smaller size, uh, for example, uh, separately. Uh, we can have uh, other resources associated with, with rooms, for example, that are listed here. Um, uh, the nurses, uh, for example, are also associated with speed. And uh, you'll notice there's a thing called nurses, should be called count nurses, um, uh, any logic in case you're listening, um, should be count nurses, not nurses. Um, uh, and uh, nurses as a um, parameter is specifying the number of nurses uh, that are, that are, are serving. Uh, at any one time. Um, so these resources are required. Uh, they're they are so-called capacitated. They're limited capacity, which limits workflow. And entities need the resources to proceed at different points. So for example, whoa, um, uh, okay. Uh, let me seize control of the module here. Um, so for example, uh, here, uh, if we're ceasing a triage room, it requires a triage room as well as requiring a nurse, okay? And the nurse is going to examine us in the triage room. And so uh, we, are, we are awaiting it with the nurse so we could have a private conversation about our complaints. Um, and uh, this accompanies this notion of seizure. It's uh, a rather transgressive terminology, but basically it says we seize the resource room. Um, and uh, there's a separate notion, which we'll be talking about of attachment. Like we may get attached to a pulse oximeter, which is placed on our finger and where we go, it goes with us. Um, so we're the entity and it travels with us. And so we may be attached to a, an entity for some period of time. Excuse me, attached. The entity may be attached to a, a resource of certain types. There's often physical homes for resources. So for example, whoa, um, the uh, nurses uh, may be associated with um, a, a home uh, that, that specifies uh, where, they, where they live and um, that would specify essentially a lounge in which they rest or, um, or a uh, location where, where they prefer to hang out when not, not in use, um, not, not uh, active. And there's uh, movement paths, which are defined with something called space markup in this context. Okay, um, so we're gonna see that uh, we can define service networks, which basically group together a set of, of parties here. This was a, a stronger construct before. Now it's, it's really used for visual elements. Um, and I don't even know that you have to specify the resources uh, associated with it, as well as the entities. It's more for space markup now. Um, but um, what's more important is that we have these resources provided uh, and these resources can be associated with a certain network. Um, let's talk about entities. So these entities are these parties on which the processes operate. These are these typically, traditionally, mostly passive parties that flow through here. Uh, they are the center of attention and the center of service delivery. Um, things happen to them. They flow through the flow chart. Um, they're often injected into it at a certain point and they disappear at the sink in contrast to that life course view this, that's quite typical in system dynamics or agent-based modeling. Um, uh, so typically there's multiple entries in the system at any one time and they interact through queuing, et cetera. Um, through queuing and we keep each other waiting typically. Um, uh, if you wanna maintain extra information on an entity and any logic that's accomplished through so-called subclassing uh, the entity. So, 
So we'll take an entity and we'll create a, a, a subclass of it that may have characteristics. So maybe it'll be age, for example, which may be used, considered in triage, or maybe it's, uh, um, they have certain uh, chronic diseases associated with them. Um, and uh, entities are often associated with some physical representation to depict them in space. So we can show stakeholders, for example, the, the ward in interaction, the hospital ward or what have you. Now, resources are needed to, uh, to allow those entities to proceed along workflows. And we divide here, um, resources can be of all different sorts, but we divide between three major sorts um, of, 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 of resources. Number one, are mobile resources. Those are ones which have a degree of agency. They can travel and they can go, you know, get equipment. They can go to a patient and, and, and uh, take escort the patient to a room. Um, they can go and um, retrieve a dose of vaccine and administer it to a patient. Um, by contrast, there are these types of resources that lack agency as we normally think of it. So some of them are static. So think about rooms, for example. These are fixed location resources. Think about an X-ray machine, which is at a fixed location. By contrast, there may be portable resources like ultrasound, portable ultrasound machines, or like an EKG machine for a heart, um, which can be wheeled around. Um, there may be wheelchairs and beds, and and those are portable. They, at this point in history, they're not wheeling themselves typically, but um, they require an actor to to wheel them. Um, uh, whether it's uh, a person accompanying a patient for a wheelchair, or you know, a staff member um, uh, who who pushes a. Uh, a gurney or a, a bed. Um, so we, um, we typically have multiple types of resources here and we define these resource pools um, associated with that. So we, we were exploring those resource pools before. Um, and uh, here, uh, these resource pools uh, provide uh, a specification of count uh, specification of break policies, for example, um, and uh, whether we whether we're collecting sorts of information on them, for example, statistics on on uh, might be availability or 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 whatnot, and uh, and we can also specify things like the speed with which they move, okay, um, and and their home locations, so. Uh, these resources exist to facilitate the uh, processing of entities. Um, to bring this out of the sphere of imagination, let's run this model. Um, so I, I just right clicked on simulation to run it. Some of you may have already done this. And uh, you know, here what we'll see is a 3D depiction of this uh, particular location. You'll note the nurses here, physicians, assistants, uh, and you'll notice these procedure rooms. And procedure rooms or examination rooms um, are, um, are in some defined locations which uh, are used to examine uh, particular patients at times, sometimes with equipment being brought along to them. Um, and you'll notice as, as parties uh, move through this space, um, uh, in, in, you know, once a, um, once a patient has arrived, for example, uh, they, they are escorted around and after some period of time, they'll leave. Uh, so within this context, we have a 3D depiction. Those of you who are interested in uh, a more novel view may, may want to use the flying camera view of it. Um, but you'll also go see that there's a logical depiction of what's going on. And uh, that basically indicates um, the status of the process, for example, how many individuals have come into this registration block and left it as well, um, how many uh, went uh, via this pathway via ult requiring ultrasound rather than x-ray, 
how many have left the process here. You'll also see some statistics here that are being accumulated um, on the, the resource use and, and utilization of what fraction of the time those resources are in use. Uh, and, you know, the model like this affords rendering uh, in, in different modes uh, for, for 3D or, or, or 2D depiction. Um, so here we have these resources. We have the entities having a face upon the world, uh, a depiction um, visually, and we have them following paths. And as we'll see, those paths are articulated as well using um, what's called space markup language. And you'll see elements of that right here um, that depict these paths through the facility and that link it up to resources such as these rooms that are, um, that are nodes in this network. Um, okay, um, so uh, resource pools can be associated with different levels of agency, uh, moving, static, portable, for example, and um, those resources can then be deployed within the, uh, the flow charts. Um, we're gonna go through um, uh, a set of building blocks for these, but bear in mind, we're gonna be examining a very simple process uh, such as that, that one that applies with this model. We won't be looking as much at some of the more advanced features such as loops, um, or such as uh, these hierarchical features, um, we will be looking at some branches and joins. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna go through the major operators of, of interest. I think I, I specified these last time, but the terminology was a little bit outdated and I've updated it since now, um, since then in preparation for this lecture. So major operators that I want to talk, we're going to be speaking about operators here within the context of um, this process. Uh, what are these building blocks, these kind of um, operations that depict processes here? Well, we have a set of them. One is the source. Uh, we see that back here. Um, and uh, this source uh, affords us a chance to specify um, how people come into the system. And it can be specified in a number of different ways. One way that should be familiar to you is, is a, a hazard rate, a chance per unit time of arrival. Same concept we saw in system dynamics for chance per unit time of leaving a stock. Same concept we saw in agent-based modeling with the rate transition between, between states. Um, we can also specify inter-arrival times, times uh, between when people arrive. Um, we can specify a table uh, or some sort of schedule where rates apply at different for different periods of time. And we can also explicitly say someone has arrived, um, which will be useful in hybrid modeling. Um, to, to link up someone, say, getting sick to them suddenly showing up in the clinic. Um, so they may get sick, travel to the clinic, and suddenly inject themselves into the clinic workflow. Um, and uh, upon time of arrival, they're commonly associated with a certain place. In this case, it's the entry door. And they move with, deliberation, uh, with deliberate speed, called patient speed which is actually a function here um, to determine uh, the speed with which they operate. You might have patients, for example, who operate at different speeds. Uh, here we specify a distribution, but in general, you could imagine, for example, a patient who, um, who might need wheelchair assistance uh, or a walker proceeding at a different speed from someone who's, um, who doesn't require those, uh, those supports. Sinks are, provide the opposite uh, side. There's less um, fuss and muss to it, um, but uh, sinks can be associated with uh, certain locations um, within the model. And uh, of greater interest is um, 
uh, entering and, and leaving a, a network, um, sort of coming into a network and leaving. This in recent versions of any logic has been largely um, um, largely unneeded because by default, it tends to work very well within uh, standard, uh, um, standard practice to have one main network of focus for most models. Um, and as we'll see, networks can be defined associated with sets of paths and nodes uh, visually. But I'd like to, to emphasize um, a few other operators that are going to uh, require more attention. One is a select output, um, which can be based on a predicate, including uh, one with uh, that that flips a coin. So this is uh, with certain probability, we are routed one way or the other, um, but we can also do it if a certain condition is true. So maybe we wanna ask what sort of complaint does the patient have or what's the underlying condition as captured by a state chart um, in a hybrid model for an agent. And we might route them differently uh, accordingly. Uh, so, so here we can have uh, selection and they can go in through different processes um, accordingly. Um, you, might, uh, you might use that, for example, to capture the fact that some small, small subset of patients require a lot more time. Um, and uh, sometime it may be stochastic, sometime it may be based on a, a more defined characteristic. One of the key ones is something called the delay. And conceptually, this is very simple, um, but it reflects the fact that we have um, time that's required by processes. So for example, in this case, the triage process requires a certain amount of minutes. Uh, triage is assessing the severity or, or acuity of a patient. Here in Saskatchewan, we have five uh, levels are called CTAS levels, uh, Canadian um, Triage Acuity Scale. And you'll, you'll be classified when you go into the emergency room after discussion with the nurse, they'll classify you in a scale of one to five. And you'll be handled based on that CTAS classification. Um, so this draws from a triangular distribution here, which is a distribution, like all distributions, it totals up to, to one, but um, it's triangularly shaped and it has a kind of single most common and, and then an upper possible value and a lower possible value in a shape like a triangle. And this is specified in minutes. So people are undergo this process. You notice how abstracted it is. Like what's going on there? Well, we abstract away from that. It's just, it takes time and others may be awaiting the triage room in that queue that's depicted there um, while, we're, while we're here. And you notice this one is associated with a, a queue by implication it says maximum queue capacity. People just wait and wait and wait until the triage room is available. So this is awaiting the triage room uh, here and, uh, and then we'll be, be going through it. We'll see how that works in just a second. Okay, now um, that will be in fact a good segue to this next stage. So recall that resources are needed to proceed. Um, if a resource is not available, um, the person will be queued, the entity will be queued uh, if a resource for which they, they need to proceed. Um, and these resources will uh, need to be allocated from specific pools. Uh, and in order to be allocated a resource, we have to undergo a process called seizing. It used to be called network seize. Now it's just named uh, more easily seize. Okay, so here we have a, a seize. Um, it requires two types of resources, a triage room resource, which is a fixed resource and a nurse resource. And there's some semantics you can set for how does it broker these? Um, and those who have taken operating systems, 332, will recognize that there's risk of deadlock here. 
you know, if it took one but not the other, if it wasn't atomic, right? If it, uh, let's suppose it sees the triage room, but not the nurse, it's waiting for the nurse. Maybe another patient will come along, the nurse will come available, that person will seize the, the, the nurse, but the triage room's not available and each will wait ad infinitum for the other resource. That's a risk. And so by default, uh, these are seized atomically um, and uh, they either need to all be available or not at all. And there is a queuing protocol which is maintained um, to dictate kind of who goes, who goes first here. Um, okay, um, so, so this is by default, you see it says seize whole set at once. Um, this sees units one by one. Um, that could lead to, to, um, uh, to deadlock, except if you always have an ordering, if you always have the same ordering, like triage rooms are seized before nurses, if that's your ordering, or if they're seized alphabetically, let's say, um, then you can avoid deadlock. That's just a, a factoid about uh, resource, um, resource competition in general, it's nothing to do with about any logic. It's about, about um, the semantics of deadlock. Um, okay, so here we have, um, uh, we have people waiting and we have to seize these resources in order to proceed. You'll notice here it says further that we send the seized resource. Now, obviously that applies only to a nurse. It's only a nurse that, um, for example, that is a, uh, a, a, a resource that has agency. It has, um, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a resource that's mobile. And I'm looking where this is specified here, but um, uh, it's uh, here, moving. They call it moving now instead of mobile. Uh, by contrast, it, it's not gonna seize the triage room because the triage room is static, okay? So here we are waiting those two resources. The, the nurse gets sent to us when we have successfully been allocated a nurse. Um, the triage room awaits us. Um, and we are, we're attached to the seized resource. And what that means is uh, they're gonna accompany us. They're gonna accompany us. And we'll see that this next stage is going to lead lead us to move to uh, an appropriate location. Now for every seize, there needs to be a release on the other end. And uh, we can see that um, for every seizing the, the triage room, there's a release of the triage room. Notice it didn't release the nurse here. Um, it, uh, it, it retained uh, the nurse being allocated to us uh, through this time but it did release the, um, the triage room. So you can release and an different, uh, different uh, subsets of resources, then you allocate them. Um, okay, so uh, I think we'll talk now about attaching and detaching. Um, we saw that when we had this nurse allocated to us, we were count as attaching to that, uh, to that resource. So here, um, the resource that's with us, uh, this nurse, we may be attached to him and, and he'll proceed with us to, for example, um, an examination room. So attaching and detaching is different than seizing and releasing. Seizing and releasing is allocating. It's a logical um, step by which we are, um, we are allocated, we are uh, specified to be, to be um, uh, assigned this resource. Attaching, detaching has to do with whether they are spatially together and whether the, when the entity goes in a place, the nurse goes with them or the resource goes with them, okay? Um, okay, so uh, maybe we'll, um, we'll go take a look at that um, that step there. So we're going to look at uh, this go to triage room. Now this is a move to, and we're going to distinguish between two 
two types of movement. One is with what's called move to, which is where the entity is going to move to a place. Where are they going to move? Well, they are going to move rather than jumping um, to a seized resource unit. And which resource unit? The triage room that they have been allocated. So by virtue of having been allocated the triage room here, the entity is going to head to it uh, at this move to block, okay? This is operating, this is specifying the rules for a particular entity. The entity moves to the triage room that they have been, that they have seized, that they have been allocated. Okay, and the speed of that movement is dictated by, you know, the distance associated with it and, and the speed. Okay, um, so they're not going in time to get there within a minute or something like that. It's by their distance and speed. And uh, we can associate up here again, the patient when they come in with a patient speed, and we can associate nurses, in fact, uh, with staff speed. Um, so maybe the patient, for example, requires more time than the nurse. Um, maybe the nurse uh, can travel at full walking speed, but the patient has a, has a walker or, uh, and, and they have to proceed therefore more slowly together. So they are going to the triage room and that will take time. Time is endogenous here. So when we go and we run this model, um, what you will find is that these rules induce a certain speed of, of um, things happening within the model. So we're uh, awaiting our first patient and here we, we go. You'll notice when they move around, that speed of movement is endogenous, right? It, it's depending on the vagaries of that patient that nurse that they happen to have and where they're going, like which, this is uh, which triage room they're going to, or if, if they go to this examination room later, how long it takes them to get there will depend on that speed. So there's a endogenous element, an emergent element that comes out of this model as to how long things take. It's not all baked in that, you know, you proceed to the triage room within you know, 10 seconds or to the examination room within, you know, a minute. It, it's going to depend on these factors together. And of course, how long you spend waiting for it is going to depend on um, the demand from other others as well. So uh, here we are, um, we are sending with network with move to, we are, we are moving the entities to a certain um, to a certain location, uh, and any resources will travel to which they're attached will travel with them. Um, there's an additional element which is uh, regrettably not illustrated in this particular model. I was hoping to get one ready for you where it be illustrated, but um, didn't have time. Where we make use of an operator called send to. Okay, now these are listed within our um, components here. We've gone through season release, attachment, move to, and now we're dealing with send to. Send to is different than move to. Move to is an operator that operates on the entity and says, go, you know, move the entity there. And any re attachments that they have, whether it's a pulse ox, or a gurney that they're in, or a, um, uh, a, a nurse that they've been allocated will move with them. Uh, by contrast, send to is sending a resource, and specifically a mobile resource to a certain location. Perhaps, for example, to go obtain the EKG machine to bring to the patient's bedside. Uh, or or uh, perhaps we send a... Um, physician's assistant to go get the, um, or the x-ray technician, or to go tell the x-ray technician that, 
you know, this patient's coming to the x-ray machine or, or what have you, or to prepare the space in the x-ray machine for a wheelchair. So um, here we have uh, these resources that uh, can be sent as mobile entities to certain places and obtain, obtain resources, okay? Um, so we're moving them to a certain place and um, uh, we can move not just one type of resource, but another type. And one of the things that's a bit subtle about this is when we move a resource, they often are doing so at the behest, at the behest of, at the, um, on the basis of, or for the pay, for a given entity. So they are acting in their capacity as something allocated to a given patient. So let's suppose it's a nurse. This nurse may need to go get the EKG machine and they need to go get the EKG machine for the sake of the patient, say the so entity to whom they have been allocated. So this nurse has a, a, an entity with which they're associated. They go get an EKG machine that's allocated for the same entity, okay? So that patient perhaps has been allocated an X-ray machine um, or an ultrasound, it's an ultrasound machine or a, an EKG, let's suppose a portable ultrasound, um, then um, they can go and obtain that. And unfortunately, uh, the ultrasound here uh, is, if I'm not mistaken, a fixed ultrasound. So we're not, um, uh, we're not able to, uh, we're not able to see that in action, but um, in other models, you'll find them going and obtaining a, um, a resource and, and bring it. In other models, for example, someone may come and, and meet the um, entity in the waiting room, and you might have that staff member then have to go get a wheelchair to, um, to bring that person through the long distance to the procedure room. Um, and so they'll, the staff member will have to go get a, a wheelchair allocated for that patient to bring them around. Okay, um, and you can move multiple resources together. For example, the, the, a mobile resource may, may move with a, um, in the, on behest of a patient, on the basis of a patient, for a patient, they move with a ultrasound machine that's been allocated to that patient or an EKG machine, a portable ultrasound or an EKG machine, which is portable allocated to them. Um, okay. Uh, so we've seen something about uh, attachment um, and uh, seen how that occurs. We have moved to, we've gone through and detach and we can um, release, um, release these, um, these resources at the end. So this is, these are the core elements that um, are often most central to, um, to this sort of discrete event simulation. Um, they choreograph what's going on within the facility logically, but accompanying them is a choreography that's um, spatial and by extension visual. Um, Within this context, entities are associated with icons. Um, resources are, are associated with locations and icons as well. Movement networks are delineated, such as using any logic space markup for, for specifying routing paths. And uh, these routing paths then serve as the routes through which the, um, the entities and mobile resources move. So for example, we might have uh, nurses here and we had noted before their staff speed and where their, their home location is. So where they go when they're not busy, for example. Um, and uh, we can associate uh, a set of paths with what's called a network. Now, networks are defined 
when you create a connected set of paths and nodes. So uh, this is through any logic space markup language for this particular package. So if we go over here and we look at cross uh, the space markup, we will find here, um, you know, we can outline rectangular nodes, polygonal nodes, paths. Um, uh, we can also specify points uh, and attractors, places where the resources will tend to sit preferentially. You, you'll, you can actually see a bunch of these um, up here. Um, ultrasound machines are arrayed in a very regular fashion, whereas physician's assistants exist in a more entropic fashion. And, um, and this space markup language um, is used to knit together these networks. For any connected component here, any set of these paths and nodes, we will have a network defined. And the network is specified here um, over, for example, under main, we specify it within the presentation area and it's under the level. And, and this ends up specifying amongst other features here, it specifies uh, this network, which is composed of all these different pieces put together um, with most of them being obtained from this uh, space markup language. And there are these little handles you frob and, and you can you know stretch them and, and route them around. And these then form the basis for the movements in the model. And it's not totally epiphenomenal. It's not totally just uh, eye candy. It does affect the movement times, right? Like we, we talked about time as an endogenous, uh, the time of movement as an endogenous feature. It's generated by the model based on where you're going, the, the, the capacities of the agents to move quickly, both staff and, and the uh, patients here. Um, that, that dictate that flow. So, um, so these networks uh, are the conduits for movement and uh, agents can be routed on them. Now you'll notice that they don't have to be, you know, the paths from A to B don't have to be unique. For example, you can get from, from this point here to this point here with two different paths. And there's nothing that says that's a problem. Um, in general, if I'm not mistaken, it will prefer uh, one of these paths or another according to length or, or time, which typically ends up being minimum for one is the minimum for the other. Um, and uh, you can have uh, routing you know, that, that will take place according to some minimum distance or minimum time from any one node to any other node. So you wanna wire these, these in. And these are wired into these nodes, which can serve as kind of these um, homes for or places in which things can take place. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll um, see a bit of that uh, here. We've already explored some of it, so I'm not gonna belabor it. Um, much, but if we look at the logical structure here, for example, um, here they have to seize an EC room. Now, um, this is allocated from a set of rooms, just like the triage room was allocated from a, from a triage room set. I'm gonna emphasize this one because there's a set of, of EC rooms. Now, the EC room the EC room set here uh, is associated with uh, a resource pool. That's what, what this specifies. And the resource pool in turn is specified over here. Um, so we here we have the resource room pools and it's associated with a set of these rooms, um, these polygons and rectangles. Um, and if you look closely, you can probably figure out what two are the rectangles. Yeah, it's this one and this one. And which are the polygonal rooms um, because they're shaped in a, in a more textured fashion. So these three here, uh, they have these kind of 
you know, um, small, small areas uh, here, which are then to allow uh, passage over here. So here we can logically join together these uh, res uh, given resource set with these visual components, which are wired into this network for routing, etc. And uh, when it comes to going to those rooms, um, any given EC room resource will know which of these rooms with which of the rooms it's associated with. So if we seize it, we can be assured that when we go to that, when the entity goes to that EC room, they are going to one specific one, the one that was associated with the resource unit that was allocated. So these rooms are considered interchangeable. It doesn't matter which we get, but once we're allocated one, we go to that one. And that's indeed what's happening here. So they're going to that particular one, okay? Um, so uh, that's a little bit about, um, you know, the, the relationship of resources logically and uh, in terms of these presentation elements. Uh, now, we can further specify some things associated with um, the iconography to use. So for example, uh, with a nurse, uh, we may wish uh, they, that they have a, an appearance which is, is somewhat different uh, based on the, um, whether they're busy or not. And here, and it, it used to be specified right there. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, maybe I have to explore it a little bit more, but essentially you could alter their appearance, whether they're idle or not. And, um, and therefore could give them um, a, a different look or even uh, make them bec become much more visible when they are allocated. Um, okay, I think we've, um, handled most of uh, the, the core things here. We have a few more minutes yet, so I want to uh, hit on a couple things that are a bit less core. One is uh, this use of, of subclassing, okay? Um, uh, subclassing is a technique that all of you will be familiar with from courses such as the MPD 270. Um, and uh, you know, it often goes along with a subtyping relationship um, that allows polymorphism, one thing to be passed around as another. Um, subclassing further provides the capacity to inherit implementations beyond just subtyping. Um, you know, subclassing uh, here provides us a way to, to further customize some of these discrete event simulation elements. Uh, so for example, rather than having, uh, when people arrive, for example, a, um, a just an allocation of any old agent, we can allocate a specific patient type. Th there is an agent, we could just say, hey, allocate agents, for example, but, um, oh, Okay, um, uh, th that's interesting. So it's actually going to create an, a new one there, but I'm going to uh, say, I wanna use a, a patient here, okay? Now, uh, a patient here is an entity, and so we can specify that um, and, and, and use them. And in fact, you'll see next time, this is how we're going to have you know, persons within our agent-based model, for example, be the entities flowing through this system. We'll specify that as our preferred uh, agent type within the context of a discrete event simulation. By contrast, um, uh, we might also be interested in having nurses, for example, specified as an agent type. Now, um, nurses could be a, a more generic resource here, but um, we're going to give them some particular characteristics uh, as, as an agent. And uh, this agent uh, can have that appearance there. 
and it can have parameters associated with them. It could even have state charts, uh, et cetera. And this starts to blur this distinction between, between agents and entities. Um, so here uh, we are allowing the presence of these any logic classes, things like uh, nurse or, um, or uh, patient or technician or ultrasound to be used within the model um, to lend additional, um, additional features um, to these uh, individual uh, resources, for example, or types of, of entities that flow through the system. Any logic used to make use of a, by default of a more generic form, you know, just a resource unit. But um, uh, now it's more common to have it have just be an, an agent type. Uh, we'll see how we can um, take advantage of that. Now I'm gonna mention one or two other um, in our closing minutes here, um, things that it's worth bearing in mind to point out to you the, um, some of the added sophistication that can come with the models. So I'm gonna go back to our, uh, uh, our flow, uh, flow chart here. And uh, I'll just note that uh, in terms of allocating particular resources and, and specifically in the context of allocating mobile resources such as nurses, um, or physicians uh, or physicians assistants like here occurs. Um, these sort of mobile resources often are available in a way that is not always uniform. So for example, um, in this model, we might have a, a number of physicians assistants specified, again, poorly named here. Um, should be count PAs, but um, in general, we might expect different numbers of physicians, assistants, and nurses to depend at different periods of time. And there's two fundamental ways we can specify that. One is through this construct called a downtime block, okay? And you can go find that, you know, um, we want the, uh, the process modeling library up here. Um, so there's a downtime block. And basically with downtime, you could specify, you know, under what conditions is, is someone, um, uh, someone working or not. And uh, this can be associated with a flow chart. Um, it can um, have a, fixed time between breaks, for example. Uh, and, and then there can be, you know, a break amount of time that that occurs per break. Um, now, beyond that, it's uh, often uh, equally important to specify things like schedules. And so here, we might, we might expect different staffing levels, for example, at night or on weekends or um, at, at, you know, over lunchtime or whatever. And uh, we can either specify that it's just not available at certain hours or that a certain number are available at certain hours um, or that they're available at a certain rate of occurrence. Um, and you know, so they become available for a certain period of time. And you could specify this for different uh, days of the week, um, you know, within a week uh, per, per day um, in a way that doesn't involve explicit calendar specification. And uh, within a, a given uh, time, within a given day, for example, you might have, you know, the hours of operation be between eight o'clock and and something like five p.m., you know, and uh, by virtue of that, okay, we have a, a, a not very uh, not very transparent error message there. The event loop exception 
has returned null. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, so, okay, now it's being truculent. Well, uh, you can use your imagination. I should probably close and open the model, but uh, you could specify it to 5 p.m., for example. Um, and, uh, or you could just specify, um, so that can be specified for times that they're on shift or times that they're off shift. And uh, this is handy for depicting actual facilities. This sort of modeling, as you might expect, um, as, as you might anticipate through, um, through this uh, uh, depiction of clock time, it often is uh, choreographed by time of day. You're dealing with service delivery within a facility, for example, which has defined hours staffing levels, uh, breaks, um, and uh, there are certain things you can do at certain times and not others, certain resources that are available, uh, computer systems may be down at certain times, what have you. And um, often the clock time is of uh, great interest. Once we specify a schedule of this sort, we can then specify, you know, a, uh, a capacity by according to a schedule uh, and have the availability of these resources therefore vary over time. Okay, so um, I haven't shown you all features of this, but um, uh, I've given you enough specifics that hopefully it's uh, general, general features should be evident. Um, I will just note that uh, this sort of modeling uh, may seem a bit daunting once you look at the size of the palette, but um, typically a small subset of these are the core ones and many others uh, see use in very specific circumstances. For example, batching and unbatching things. Um, uh, conveyors for certain types of factory operations. Um, uh, you, can, you can go and sort of have material handled in different ways within the context of when you are, um, are handling continuous quantities of things. Uh, maybe it's a stirred tank reactor and, and product from that. Also within any logic using building blocks that, that can be woven into uh, to workflows. But this sort of modeling uh, should hopefully be something that in terms of its basic elements, you feel a certain degree of comfort with. Uh, the things like seize, release, um, attachment and detachment, moving to sending and, and resource send to, uh, enter or source and sync. Um, the role of resources and gating the progress of entities, the role of a workflow, um, queues as queuing up when resources are not available. Those are all elements of this uh, form of modeling that are front and center. And those are the things I'd expect you to internalize um, for this module of the course. Next time, we will be continuing on to, uh, to examine hybrid modeling, and we'll be seeing that discrete event simulation, uh, particularly coupled with agent-based modeling, uh, jointly form a formidable tool for examining broader contexts where we also have um, resource-limited service delivery. Think COVID-19 contact tracing processes handled by by description and discrete event simulation in the spread of infectious disease, or think lab testing. You know, our lab has reached out to me a number of times to, to help advise them on, on what sort of capacity they need for our lab to not be the bottleneck, um, our, our prof lab, the Roy Romano lab. Um, you might think of it as well in door-to-door -door screening um, as such as occurred in some of our communities to find infected people in households. Um, many other uh, procedures, even outside of healthcare institutions and within healthcare institutions, um, needless to say, like RUH next door, um, we have a great deal of need for this sort of discrete event simulation 
jointly with agent-based modeling that where agents come into these facilities. So we'll see that next time. And on Tuesday, we will see um, our province's COVID-19 agent-based model, which um, depicts how hybrid modeling can be used at scale to good effect, simulating the entire provincial population of Saskatchewan schools, healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, homeless shelters, aspects associated with, with um, specific uh, context in each and every community of any size within Saskatchewan captured by their demographics with interaction with movement of individuals be, uh, between, between particular communities, et cetera. That's all coming on Tuesday and it will build on some of the key ideas from this lecture as well as from next lecture with hybrid modeling. Uh, so that's in the docket for us uh, for now. I hope this lecture has been helpful in expanding some of your understanding of at a nitty gritty level, how one goes about conducting discrete event modeling and the building blocks out of which these models are built and some of the semantics associated with them. Um, we will, uh, return to these uh, a little bit of that uh, next time within our hybrid modeling lecture. Okay, um, I'm going to, I'm unfortunately uh, not able to stop what's called screen sharing here. So I'm not even sure uh, if you're looking at my screen or, or my face right now, but um, in uh, just a few minutes, I'll be uh, going off to uh, for five minutes and coming back for office hours. Are there any questions I can answer right now uh, over the next two minutes? Um, I was just wondering about um, how how the discrete event models handle uh, stochasticity. Um, kind of if say you had a, a random patient come in who uh, had a higher level of need than others and resources got allocated there instead? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's a great question. Um, these models are intensively stochastic. They share that as well with agent-based models. Um, the, uh, as in agent-based models, there's a lot of happenstance when people show up um, who, um, you know, who happened to get in just before another in the queue, um, how long exactly a procedure took for a given patient. Um, uh, there's a lot of vagaries of chance um, that shape patients' evolution through the system. Um, and uh, that ends up affecting the outcomes. And like in agent-based modeling, that induces variability in outcomes, which, um, from a computational standpoint is an inconvenience in the sense that to get clarity on the broad features of the results, the regularities, we typically have to run the model many times um, and summarize statistics across an ensemble of these realizations, these particular runs. Uh, but um, at the same time, it's an advantage because often you see variability in actual statistics from the world about facilities. And if you want to explain that variability, it's handy to have a type of modeling, as with agent-based modeling, where variability occurs as well. And you know that can help you want to explain, for example, if what you see from real-world data is likely to be a really important effect, the certain trend, or whether it's quite possibly just chance combined with the the, the sort of ways in which data is, is collected and, and specified. And indeed, uh, in our modeling, we, we've shown, for example, that patterns that people were concerned about, you know, are, are quite, prop, po quite possibly, given how they're measuring the data, you can have a model which has no point of concern and where the same pattern recurs many times just because of chance. Um, and certain ways of summarizing the data are especially vulnerable to that. And um, so when we have statistics, it does get in the way of outcomes. Um, you can have one person short change because the triage nurse already assigned someone with lower acuity uh, a triage room instead of them. Um, 
and uh, or you know took them to a tree ashram or assigned them a room, assigned them a nurse, and that person with higher acuity is kept waiting by default. But there is, and I probably should have mentioned this a moment, uh, you know, a minute or two earlier. There is this notion of preemption, and in the queue within this sort of modeling queue constructs like this queue here, um, uh, you can have preemption. And preemption does allow a queue to yield the primacy of the first position or, you know, give higher priority to someone of higher perceived priority or, or you know, acuity in this case. And so we can enable preemption and there's a, uh, a mechanism for achieving it which is associated, if I'm not mistaken, with the left of these little green dots. And so someone coming in can, uh, can be preempted, uh, can preempt others who are less, less serious situation and they can be put at the front of the queue. And so that's one of the main ways in discrete event simulation we, we do deal with um, just structurally disadvantaging people and putting them all in the same order despite differences in acuity or priority. Hope that's helpful in answering your question. Glad to talk more about it in office hours. Thank you. Okay, thank you folks. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. I'm working to get problem set four out within a couple of days here. Um, it's partway done now, we'll see see what I can get done um, in the next two, three days. Hopefully by the end of the week, uh, it'll be in your hands. Thanks very much.